Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the IET Surrey. So we're the volunteers for the IET based in the south of England. And uh, today's webinar, I hope you uh, are just uh, coming back, joining us again from uh, one of our previous webinars uh, a few weeks ago. And tonight's topic is a little bit of a change. We're going on to communications today and talking about 5G. And in particular, um, I, I suppose 5G has been uh, spoken about uh, many, many times, and, and it's uh, one of those topics which keeps coming around. The IET's done quite a few events on it. But we're gonna take a different look at that today and uh, think about how the visions of what 5G can do in transforming our lives have uh, either been enhanced or uh, set back by the global events of COVID and uh, such things as um, the bans on Chinese technology, which uh, at, at, up to that point had been quite central to uh, the advancement of uh, 5G. So uh, we'll get onto that in a moment. Our um, speaker today is, is William Webb, uh, and I'll introduce him in just a moment. So a few bits of housekeeping just before we, uh, we move on. Uh, first of all, um, my name's Nigel Ward and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, I'm going to guide you through the webinar and uh, after William has given his presentation, he'll be delighted to take some questions from you. Um, and uh, we have a team of people looking out for your questions and we will um, curate those um, uh, probably lots of questions will come in and we may not get the opportunity to put your question word for word but we'll summarize several similar questions if necessary uh, so that we have uh, a good range of topics that we can grill William on at the end. Now if you want to submit a question please use the the Zoom Q&A facility if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A button and uh, feel free to enter your questions uh, throughout uh, the, uh, this evening's event. And um, then our team of question uh, masters will uh, put those to William uh, towards the end. Um, so um, another point that, uh, that I'd like to make is, is really a warm welcome to, to those people wherever they are in the world. And um, in fact, we are located somewhere in England, in the world, in Europe. Now I know that we've got visitors today who are joining us from all parts of the globe. And to those over in the, the East, in Hong Kong and Malaysia, um, it's, it's a very early morning for you and uh, thank you very much for joining. Over on the other side of the world uh, from where we are in Canada, uh, good afternoon to you. And to all those people in uh, South Africa, India, Malaysia, Turkey, P Pakistan and Ireland, a very warm welcome to you as well. So without further ado, I'd like to now um, introduce uh, our speaker for this evening, uh, William Webb. Now, um, for those of you that, uh, that know William, uh, he's got a very illustrious uh, career in um, the areas of communication and technology. And uh, in fact, despite his youthful looks, 30 years in communications, and he's advised governments, manufacturers, operators, and uh, the money men in uh, wireless communication, uh, not only in the UK, but across the world. In addition to that, um, uh, personally, I, I served as the honor honorary treasurer of the IET during William's period as the president of the IET. So uh, a, a very strong uh, connection with the, the ethos of spreading um, the knowledge and uh, skills across the world. Couldn't really be more uh, said about that than from the, a former president of the IET. So without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to William and he will uh, take us through his presentation. Thank you so much, Nigel. That, and that's a great introduction. Let me see if I can get my screen up. That's always the first test to pass. Uh, that looks promising. And can I make it even go into 
full mode. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, so welcome everyone. Uh, as Nigel has said, welcome from, from wherever you are in the world and whatever time zone you're in. And I'm going to talk for probably 30 to 35 minutes or so um, about 5G and, and in particular the influence of COVID. But of course, 5G was designed well before COVID and 5G will be with us hopefully long after COVID. Um, hopefully I say because I hope COVID is going to be um, either eradicated or at least managed quite quickly. So in some respects, it's a blip in the, in, in the history of 5G, um, but an important one. So I'm going to spend a fair amount of time initially sort of setting the scene of, of where we were prior to COVID. And then only towards the, the end of my presentation, I'll then look at what's actually happening as a result of, of COVID and, and the impact that's having on, on communications and particularly on 5G. Uh, and then finish up with some overall thoughts about where we might be going in the future uh, with communications. And hopefully it'll stimulate lots of discussion, lots of questions. Um, I'm known for being fairly controversial when it comes to 5G, so um, I'm hoping that there'll be others that will put forward viewpoints as well as questions. I'd really welcome that. We can perhaps, with as much as we can within the confines of a virtual world, have a, have a little bit of a discussion around those areas. So let's just remind ourselves what we are hoping or hyping about 5G. And if you go back to 2016 or thereabouts, then you'd often hear a lot of discussion around the fact that 5G was going to um, add a thousand fold capacity to the network. It was going to connect a hundred fold more devices. It was ideally going to be about a tenth of the, the energy consumption compared to, to existing solutions. And of course, it was going to be fast, really fast, um, ideally sort of a hundred times as fast as, as 4G. So those were, the, those were the design aspirations. And those goals, of course, are you know, incredible goals. And that's to some degree what led to a number of bodies to, to effectively indicate that they believed that 5G was a radical transformation uh, rather than just an evolution of the network it was going to transform communications in a way that perhaps no previous generation of mobile communications had done before and you see in that top quote it will be as revolutionary as electricity or the automobile um, now that's a pretty strong statement um, to be as revolutionary as electricity it's got to be really quite something and of course that has then led to to governments wanting to to win the 5g race if there is such a thing as a 5g race or at least wanting to be deeply involved in 5g policy and as nigel mentioned that in itself has then led to all of the the political angst about national ownership of of companies um, and of course the effective banning of huawei in the uk and many other countries uh, and, and all of that kind of thing as well so you know, this is, this is put forward and a lot of the, the rationale for what we talk about with 5G is on the basis of the idea that, that it, is, it is a revolution. It's going to bring about something quite radically different than we've seen before. And of course, that's a, that's a big um, hurdle to, to, to jump. So um, we'll be looking at whether indeed it's likely to do that or not. Um, and, you know, spoiler alert, almost certainly not. Um, but then you'd expect that because things are always hyped more than they um, are realistically going to achieve. But before we even think about whether 5G is technologically designed to achieve that, it's worth taking a step back and looking at the industry. And of course, for any new technology to happen and to succeed, the first thing that's got to happen is that the the mobile operators have got, to, have got to invest. They've got to go out and buy this kit, uh, buy the spectrum in the first place, then buy the kit, deploy it into their networks, uh, and then advertise it, develop services, all the other kinds of things they need to do. And that, of course, is a, a, a big, expensive undertaking. For the UK, we, it's, it's of the order per operator of at least three billion pounds when you add in the spectrum and then the cost of the 5G deployment and so on. <clears throat> Potentially much more than that if 5G becomes a much more dense network with a vast number of small cells. But the operators are not actually in a great place 
So um, let's start with the chart on the bottom right. Uh, it's not the clearest of charts, but it's a, a 10 year stock price taken from 2009 to 2019. And I've picked a couple of companies there, Vodafone and AT&T. It could be any mobile operator, frankly, they're all pretty much the same when it comes to this. And the, and the orange line is the, the Dow Jones over that period. So the Dow Jones has tripled over that 10 year period, but the mobile operator's stock price has stayed the same, basically. It's gone up and down a bit, but it's ended up back where it started. So essentially, those companies are now worth a third as much as they were 10 years ago relative to their peers in the, in, in the large indices. That's pretty true of all mobile operators. They have been disastrous investments. If you chose to invest your money in, in mobile operators, that's pretty much the worst thing you could have done compared to any other companies in the, in the C100 or similar large indices of companies. And of course, there's reasons for that. And the fundamental reason is they're not growing um, and they're not growing in revenue terms because there's nobody else to get a cell phone. Everyone who wants one has got one. And competition has been quite intense in most countries and it's gradually driven down the monthly ARPUs, average revenues that we pay. So, you know, we're benefiting from that. We're used to seeing our bills <clears throat> gradually trickle down by a few percent each year. Two or three percent is quite typical year on year on year. Um, but of course, that means for the mobile operators, their overall revenues are also going down by about the same amount. But their capital expenditure is not. It's flat at best, if not increasing. Uh, and, you know, the net, and, and their debts are going up. Uh, and the net result of all of that is not a, a happy picture for the operators. And over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of them do things like sell off their masts to, to mast owner companies in an effort to reduce their debt burden. But of course, that's effectively selling off the family silver. You've then got to pay rental on using those masts. So you're kind of solving the problem today, but you're making it a much bigger problem downstream. Why is this happening? I mean, what, why are operators who are delivering such a must-have service unable to make money? Well, by and large, it's because of the tight regulation around the industry. And in particular, normally in an industry where competition becomes so intense that the returns on investment are not set to normal, uh, is that, that some companies either merge or exit. But that's pretty much impossible in, the, in, the, in this space. And where mobile operators have tried to merge, those mergers have often been disallowed by the competition authorities, either in the UK or at an EC level or in other countries. So you know, that's meant that the operators are rather stuck, they can't merge. Exiting is possible, but you can't sell your business to anyone else on exit. So it's, it's a pretty horrible thing to have to do. And so the industry sort of chugs along um, in this rather precarious situation. Uh, and of course, it's hoping that 5G might have something to do with resolving that particular pressure. But of course, in order to get there, it's got to make a big upfront investment. Uh, and if you're in a, a poor financial situation, that makes such an investment all the more risky. So that's the backdrop for where we're, we've got to head in order to deploy 5G. <clears throat> and if we now look at where the upsides might come from, I think we'll find there's, there's a lot of uncertainties around the hype. So by and large, mobile operators, I think, have accepted that it's unlikely that, that the consumers, you and I, will pay more for 5G connectivity. Um, they, they tried that in the past with 4G, they tried to, to raise the tariffs and very quickly gave up because competition eroded that quite quickly. Uh, and by and large, most people weren't prepared to pay more for something they didn't perceive added a huge amount of value to them at the time. So if we're not going to see increased revenues from consumers, then we have to look to business. And that's where the big hope is for 5G, that it will lead to increased revenues from businesses or from things, from connected devices, from the internet of things. So the first uncertainty revolves around the internet of things. And we need to, to unpick some of the 5G hype here. So, 
So you heard me say at the start that 5G aims to connect 100 times more devices. The problem is that actually, even though that was an aspiration for 5G, within the 5G specifications, there's nothing for Internet of Things. That's quite staggering. It's a rather bigger mission. Uh, instead, what 5G has said is that they will take the 4G Internet of Things technologies and simply rebrand them as 5G. And the key 4G Internet of Things technology is called Narrowband or NB IoT. It's been around for five or six years now. It's been deployed here in the UK by Vodafone. And in most countries, there's at least one operator that has deployed narrowband Internet of Things as part of their 4G network. Uh, and that's now just going to be relabeled as a 5G technology. So essentially, the hope is that somehow this whole space will, will pick up, um, even though it's unchanged in terms of its technology, that there's going to be some growth there. So are we likely to see the Internet of Things pick up quickly over the next few years, you know, regardless of whether it's to do with 5G or not? Well, let's look back 10 years. If we go back to, to 2010, 2011, there was a couple of predictions made then by Ericsson and by Cisco, which really grabbed the headlines and grabbed the imagination. And they predicted that by 2020, there will be 50 billion connected devices. And actually that doesn't seem on the face of it too outrageous a prediction in that there are of roughly 5 billion people on the planet with mobile phones. So that's about 10 connected devices per person. Now, those devices might not necessarily be associated with a particular person. They may be sensors in traffic lights or whatever, um, but, but an aggregate, they aggregate to an average of 10. And, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a cycling geek, but I have um, six IoT devices just on just one of my bikes, um, let alone the others. So um, for me, that, that, that feels like an underestimate of where we were likely to arrive at. Now, of course, we're in 2020. Do we have 50 billion devices? Well, no. Now, it's really hard to count how many we have because many of these are just bought by consumers or other people. They reside in the home. They don't have a subscription and therefore there's no easy way of counting them. You can count chipsets sold or that kind of thing, um, but it's quite hard to really know. It's also quite hard to define categories. So you know, are wearables, Internet of Things devices, or are they variants of a smartphone? So there's a whole load of you know, sort of gray areas. Um, but putting that to one side, this is a, a forecast from a, a company called Transformer. Uh, and one of their founders, a guy called Matt Hatton, and I put together a, a book on what was happening and what had happened in the Internet of Things um, that we published just a few months ago. And, and Transformer estimate that in 2020, there are 8.5 billion IoT devices globally. Now that's, that's a big number, but it's nowhere near 50. It's less than 20%. And most of those devices, perhaps 95% of them are in the home or in the office. They're not connected to, to cellular or wide area networks. They're connected to Wi-Fi or similar kinds of things, which is fine, nothing wrong with that but it clearly isn't a revenue driver for mobile operators if most of those devices are not connected to their networks. Transformer predict that we'll get to about 24 billion devices by 2030 um, and they haven't gone beyond that but if you keep on extrapolating then you know, somewhere between 2035 and 2040 we might get to 50 billion. Uh, now mobile generations typically last about 10 years, 5G arrived this year, probably um, a little bit last year. So by 2030, we'll probably be seeing the end of five, well, the, the, the development of a new generation, 6G or whatever, you know, who can tell? Um, but whatever, it's unlikely that by the time that, that we have peak 5G, we'll see anything like 50 billion connected devices, 24 billion perhaps. Um, and most of those are not on cellular, and sadly, the ones that are are probably not paying very much. So in my previous slide, I tantalizingly showed a, a narrowband IoT SIM card. 
that cost 10 euros that provided enough data for long enough for a typical Internet of Things device for its entire lifetime, its entire 10 years, because most devices send very, very little information. 10 euros for 10 years, that's one euro a year. That's, you know, what, eight euro cents per month um, compared to what the average user spends for their cell phone, roughly 20 euros. So you know, the revenue from IoT is tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, so the numbers are small, the revenue is small. This doesn't look on the face of it like an area that, that is, is going to grow in any rapid way. So what went wrong? Why have we only got 8 billion connected devices when we thought we'd have 50? And is that going to change dramatically in the future? And I could spend a whole talk going through what went wrong, but this is the really quick picture. In essence, uh, the idea that everything should be connected from um, connected toothbrushes to the apocryphal connected fridge, when actually a lot of these things don't have a lot of value in being connected uh, and therefore nobody really went for it. The idea that actually the only problem is connecting a device. Um, in fact, if you're a farmer, you decide you're going to connect your cows, just having a collar around their necks is useless. You need a whole system that can collect that data, can process it, can turn it into useful insight to you and can use that to, to change the way you farm in order that you get some productivity benefit from it. And that's a lot more than simply a collar that goes on a cow's neck. And that is the assumption that unlike cellular way, just handing out handsets to people was sufficient. Um, sadly, cows don't come to the, to the Apple store and buy their tags and go off happy uh, afterwards. And in the same vein, you know, this the whole idea of adding IoT connectivity into a system typically requires significant change to that system. So if you're turning a factory into a smart factory, you may now need far fewer blue collar workers, far more white collar workers, a lot more people with IT skills, a lot less people with mechanical skills. Um, that may mean a whole different workforce. It may mean retraining. It may mean changes in the way that you accept your incoming parts and send your outgoing systems. It may mean changes to, to the way that you do your, your finances, your accounting, your HR. The whole structure of the firm may need to be changed in what's often called digital transformation in order to really make this IoT stuff work. A bit like when computers first appeared, you know, they weren't much use until you really started to change the way you work to, to adapt to them. Uh, there's problems with standards and there's also problems with the value chain, which I sort of hinted at that the value chain is insufficient for the mobile operators to, to make good returns. The other area that 5G says perhaps is the real breakthrough is a kind of very high performance IoT solution. Um, it's often called ultra reliable low latency communications. And the idea here is that you enable machines to, to talk with a latency that is ideally just a few milliseconds compared to roughly the 40 to 50 milliseconds that you might expect from a, a reasonable 4G connection today. And that will enable a whole load of tactile applications where people can do things at a distance. And the first, one of the first applications that was put forward for this, and indeed is often still put forward, is the idea that this would enable remote surgery, the surgeon being some distance away from the patient. And you know, that's a very laudable thing. But is that a reasonable thing? So in this picture, you can see a remote surgeon. I can't imagine them doing that whilst walking down the street. Um, you, you know, you've got a, an obviously huge piece of machinery that you need in order to immerse you in that environment and to control what's going on. So you know, you're not going to put this um, somewhere out in some park. It's going to reside in a hospital or similar. And if it resides there, it's not going to use 5G, frankly. In fact, you can see a, a nice blue fiber cable hanging off the side of the machine. That's what I would use if I had that kind of machine. I'll connect it by fiber cable to a really fast landline network. And even if it did use 5G, how many remote surgeons are there in the world? A few thousand at best. Um, it's not going to change the dynamics. 
And this is what we see a lot with this concept of ultra reliable. Yes, there are potentially applications, but will they really deliver value and deliver revenues for mobile operators? And I think that's, that's still a really big open question. Um, the, the operators to some degree have sort of churned around trying to find a, a problem that needs the solution that they've got or might have. Uh, and they've churned across remote surgeons, they've churned across autonomous vehicles, and now they're hoping that perhaps automated factories might be a, a good solution. But all the recent um, data on that suggests that actually the factories that do want to have these kind of networks would probably want to deploy them themselves and own them themselves in the same way that they own their own Wi-Fi and IT networks. And that's okay for the manufacturers of equipment, the Ericsons and Nokias of this world, but not for the mobile operators who will be cut out of that loop. And if the mobile operators aren't in this loop and aren't ge generating returns, then that's obviously problematic for the whole of the, the 5G ecosystem. Let's delve a little bit more in, into that space. So um, the idea is broader really than just the latency. And there's a lot of hope being pinned on what's called release 16, R16 of the, the 5G specifications. And release 16, enables what's called standalone operation. So again, it's a long description that I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase very quickly, but the current 5G systems rely on 4G to handle all of the, the connectivity and they only then pass the data, the user data, but all the control information is sent over a 4G network. So you can't deploy 5G by itself in a standalone manner. Release 16 will allow you to do that and that then allows you to, to bring in a whole load of new 5G features um, into the core, which in principle could deliver the low latency. Um, and it could deliver something called network slicing that you've probably heard of. So I've talked a bit already about the latency. I guess one other point to note is that uh, we already have low latency. Um, whilst 4G is not as good as 5G aims to be, Wi-Fi is. And uh, and I've many a time I've 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 done pings from Wi-Fi networks in hotels and in airports and in various you know, homes and offices, and I typically find a latency five seven milliseconds, uh, so well below forty. So to some degree, if if there was a real requirement for low latency services, we might have seen some of them start to bubble up on Wi-Fi already, particularly the ones that that are indoors and most of the ones put forward like virtual reality would probably be indoors. Back to slicing. The idea of network slicing is a really neat one. It's that actually you can take one physical network, a 5G network, and make it look like a lot of separate networks. So to the end user, it might appear that there's actually 10 or 20 different 5G networks, some of which are very high performance, but high cost, and some of which are low performance and low cost. Now they're all the same network, but essentially they're, they're virtual looks at that network. Um, and uh, you know, in the same way that different classes of travel on, on airplanes, it's all the same plane, but it's a different sort of way of slicing the resource of that plane to give some people a bigger space and other nice things in the days when we used to go on planes. Um, so you know, slicing potentially could be quite nice it could allow, for example, um, emergency services to have a very high priority access to the network. It could allow factories that need absolute guarantees of reliability because if the network goes down, then so does their manufacturing process to have something akin to that. Whilst those of us who don't worry quite so much about um, absolute reliability, but do worry about price, might be happier to have the the low tier, low QoS or quality of service slice in our network. But actually it turns out it's really, really hard to guarantee much in this space. So uh, how are you going to guarantee to, to somebody that they've got absolute certainty of getting onto a radio network when actually there's all sorts of things that could prevent that? So you're trying to sell something that has no real guarantee. It's a bit like saying, I'm gonna try and sell you 
a nicer seat on the plane. Now, there's no guarantee it'll be nicer, but we just, you know, all things being equal, we hope that we'll give you a nice seat. Um, it's going to cost more, um, but we can't actually promise anything. You know, that's not a particularly attractive business proposition. Even worse, actually, the data shows that um, where you get connectivity problems, 90% of the time, it's a coverage issue lack of radio signal, either in rural areas, which is where people think of it most often, but also in buildings, trains, planes, those kind of areas. And that kind of thing obviously isn't affected by slicing. So again, you know, slicing looks like a difficult issue or to a difficult service to, to really deliver. Uh, and that's not something that I think has yet been thought through. It's part of the 5G hype that simply having slicing will change everything dramatically. Okay. Another uncertainty around 5G is the extent to which we will deliver vast improvements in capacity. And to do that, we need a lot more small cells because whilst 5G brings some benefits in terms of more spectrum and potentially a more efficient radio interface, although we'll come back to why that might not be the case shortly. In order to deliver the, the huge aspiration of a thousand fold capacity increase, then the only way to do that is to have a lot of cells. But actually, and this is quite a complicated chart that again, I'm not gonna really drill into. At the moment, it turns out that the benefit of adding small cells into an existing network is not that great. The first two or three, if they're well targeted, at the places where the user's density is really high, shopping streets, sports stadium, wherever it might be, can offload a significant amount of traffic. But beyond that, actually, a small cell doesn't really cover many users. And in particular, it doesn't cover users who are indoors very effectively. Particularly in dense areas, small cells are normally at a fairly low height. And that means that, that they don't cover well into tall buildings, only the, the lower floors. But also they tend to fire down a street. And that means that apart from the buildings very close to the small cell, the incidence of the radio waves on the buildings is fairly oblique. And so it doesn't really penetrate well into the building. So actually they're not great unless you can get them inside the building. And that's really been an issue for mobile operators for many years. And there's nothing in 5G that, that really helps with that. Uh, and, and if we have time, we'll come back as to why that's a real problem. So small cells perhaps are, are unlikely to, to proliferate. In building, of course, we have an alternative uh, and that's Wi-Fi. I suspect most of you are connected via Wi-Fi right now. And pretty much every building in a place like the UK has got Wi-Fi connectivity. We're also gradually enabling more shared Wi-Fi systems, either within those buildings or more generally through mechanisms that allow people to access other Wi-Fi hotspots. Now, of course, you can tend to do that already in Starbucks or whatever, once you've gone through the process of signing up and creating a user account and, and so on. And then after that, you normally automatically log on. So it's not yet a particularly seamless and easy experience but all the predictions are that the, that the revenue from access points and controllers is going to grow pretty substantially, has been growing substantially, will continue to grow substantially. Uh, and you know, interestingly, if you go back a few years, Wi-Fi was not seen to be a good substitute for cellular because it couldn't do the kind of voice calls that, that, that cellular could. Um, it couldn't really accept an incoming voice call. Uh, it was very hard to make one over Wi-Fi and it just didn't really work well. Of course, that, that's changed dramatically now. Um, handsets have mostly got embedded Wi-Fi calling, which means it, they can use Wi-Fi without you even knowing. But actually, of course, more of us use other ways of making voice calls now, like WhatsApp and similar, that are inherently applications that will run over any underlying connectivity mechanism, including Wi-Fi. And then finally, um, it's certainly true of the younger generation that they've, they really make um, voice calls. Uh, voice is not really uh, the preferred medium anymore. Uh, and so um, that, that whole issue is fading away, meaning that, that 
in fact, we're becoming more and more accepting of not necessarily having a good mobile signal inside as long as we've got a Wi-Fi system that, that we can log on to. So those are some of the question marks. Um, 5G has now been deployed. Um, it's a reality. Uh, it's been deployed for getting on for two years in some countries. And it's been deployed to the extent now that, that people are using it, of course, uh, and um, various companies are able to start testing it. And what the chart on the, the top shows, is, which is quite interesting, is data taken from, from users' handsets, crowdsourced data. And it's, it's the average data experience that a user gets if they had signed up to a 5G package. So what this takes into account is the data rate they get on 5G when they're connected to 5G, but also the data rate they'll get on 4G if there's no 5G connection in that space and the network causes them to fall back to 4G. So effectively, it's a true account of what an end user would see if they'd signed up and paid for a 5G phone and a 5G package. And in many countries, it's really no, not materially different from 4G. That's certainly true of the UK and the US, um, where those sort of data rates are not that different from the average data rates that you'd expect to get if you had a fairly good 4G connection somewhere like a major city or similar. There are some exceptions to that. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia looks pretty good, um, but for the most of the the major countries, um, it's not actually delivering a significant speed increase, certainly not the, the, the hundredfold that was, that was talked about, um, and not really enough for anyone to notice any difference. And at the bottom, there's an interesting article from the Washington Post where uh, they've done some pretty intensive measurements with a wide range of handsets across a wide range of cities uh, across the US, and actually come to the conclusion 5G was slower than 4G. Now, to some degree, that's teething problems, and it's down to um, the constant handoffs that take place between 5G and 4G, which slows down the overall net user data rate and so on. Um, but nevertheless, it's not a great start for 5G. And it's also down to the fact that coverage is not, is not particularly widespread, as we know. Um, so not a good start speed-wise. And as I mentioned at the, at the start of the talk, not a good story revenue wise either in that almost every operator in almost every country is offering 5g for either the same as 4g or less than 4g um, and so they're getting less revenue the only exception i know of to that is south korea where they are seeing a revenue uptick on 5g and you know, maybe that's maybe that's wherever else will go and maybe that's kind of a precursor and everyone else will get there um, but it seems unlikely uh, and South Korea is, is materially different from other countries in its desire to use new technologies. Um, so we shouldn't despair because South Korea shows that, that potentially there is an upside, but equally I don't think we should assume that every other country will, will get there. Uh, and as, as Nigel mentioned, as I've mentioned, not only is there being problems in terms of delivery of, of good 5G coverage and speed, there's been problems in the supply chain with clearly um, Huawei being banned. Uh, they were widely seen as the leading supplier of 5G. Uh, that's a significant setback to the choice that operators have and a very significant setback to those operators that have got Huawei equipment in their network that they're now going to need to, to remove, which clearly both adds to their costs and slows the speed that they can deploy 5G at. Now, you know, Many people would argue it's early days yet. Um, we shouldn't get too bothered by what we're seeing at the moment. Um, we need some time for this to all settle down. And, and you know, there's some truth in that. But equally, this is what investors are seeing as well. And it's worrying them significantly that, that, that 5G is not going to deliver the, the hundredfold speed increase, the thousandfold capacity increase, the revolution that's akin to the introduction of electricity that's been promised. If you look at this, it's hardly any difference. I mean, it's not even an evolution. It's kind of a slight tweak on the status quo um, that we see at the moment. So what's behind all of this? Um, so um, now I appreciate that this chart is slightly fuzzy. Uh, I actually deliberately lifted it from a submission that was made to, to an Ofcom consultation. Um, so it's publicly available. Uh, and it's one of the mobile operators 
giving some data on the spectrum efficiency they expect to get for 5G compared to the signal to interference and noise ratio, the quality of signal that they perceive. And there's three different colored lines on there. Um, we can ignore the, the yellow line, that's kind of a single antenna system. Um, the blue line is a what's called a two by two antenna system, which is available in pretty much every device. So that's you know, representative of, of a standard device, a standard connection. That's our baseline. The red line is what happens when we have more antennas. And, and this in, in this case, it's what's called a four by four system, four antennas at the base station, four antennas in the handset. And the use of extra antennas is one of the things that, that 5G is, is promised to, to deliver big gains. Um, but what you see here is that they only deliver gains when you get a really high signal to noise ratio. And at the bottom, I've added my assessment of how many users fall into each area based on some simple models that I produced. So this is not actual hard data, but it's essentially some, some basic models. And what you see is unfortunately, the vast majority of the users reside in the low signal to noise ratio camp, where the spectrum efficiency is actually pretty low, below one bits per second per hertz. And none of these new antenna systems really come into their fore. And in that case, actually you end up with an efficiency of 5G that's worse than 4G. Now, that's not because 5G is bad technically, it's because it uses a different frequency, a much higher frequency. And so um, the signal level falls away much more quickly and many more users are in the low signal level band than would be the case for 4G that might be running in an 800 megahertz band giving a much higher signal level. So um, that's one of the key reasons why 5G is not yet delivering dramatic improvements in speed. Changing that though would require a different deployment strategy and that means moving to a small cell grid. And that could be challenging. So it feels to me that at the moment, you know, there's no clear way to, to move to a position where it's obvious that the revenue flows from 5G will more than compensate for the extra costs associated with it. And you know, at the moment, the mobile operators, the MNOs and others are, are somewhat grasping at straws. They've, they've tried to find, as I said before, many different applications that their um, solution, is, that their system is, is the solution to many problems that effectively they can solve. And they're still struggling to, to find that. And they're now saying, well, that's okay. We'll just become an IT company and then we can deliver complete solutions and services. Well, transforming a company is pretty difficult to do. And they'd then be up against the likes of Accentures and, and Googles and others who are already great IT companies. So that would move them into a space where it'd be very difficult to compete. Okay, so um, a very long preamble. Let's now move to, to COVID. What can we say about COVID? Well, actually it reduces the need for mobile networks in the developed world. I think, and, and that's a big caveat for what I'm going to say in the next few slides. In the developing world where there is poor or non-existent home broadband, or people use the mobile as the only connectivity device, even in the home, because they don't own a laptop or a tablet or a computer, then the situation is quite different because there the mobile networks have had to handle traffic that would otherwise probably have taken place in the office or the workplace where it might have taken place over a landline network. But putting that to the to an side, what COVID has done in the developed world is move us all broadly back to our homes where we've used Wi-Fi. Uh, and that's meant we use less cellular, a lot more Wi-Fi. We've seen traffic actually fall on some mobile networks. And we've seen traffic move, obviously, from city centers where the, the networks were most congested to the, the urban areas where networks may not have had the capacity, but the capacity isn't too hard to incre increase because it's putting an extra card in. Uh, so um, a significant change in the use of mobile networks, both in the volume and the geographical spread of where that takes place. Of course, the converse is that fixed networks have become much more heavily loaded with a doubling of traffic in some cases. But actually that's fine by and large. All that's meant is that the evening peak now becomes a, a plateau that lasts most of the day, but it still doesn't take us beyond the capability of those networks. Uh, and so 
uh, a bit more pressure on the home Wi-Fi maybe, but not a big difference for the fixed networks. So what does that mean for 5G? Well, first of all, 5G is mostly deployed in cities. We aren't going to cities anymore. So the chances of us being to act, able to access 5G are lowered just from a geographical point of view. COVID has also slowed down the specification process, which will stretch out the, the times for deployment of, of the release 16 standalone architecture that would bring potentially new features. And it's made the whole financing of anything harder, frankly. Um, so 5G network deployment is harder too. So it feels as a result that 5G kind of needs a bit of a refresh, um, given that it's not going to be a huge value to most people, at least until COVID and, and the behavioral changes associated with it have passed away. What would I do if I were designing a network, taking everything I said into account and considering COVID as well? And I'm nearly finished here, so just a couple more slides and then, and then um, we'll wrap up. So I think it's worth noting that, first of all, clearly wireless is, is utterly critical to our world. Uh, even when we're in the home connected to the home broadband, we're connected to the home broadband wirelessly via Wi-Fi or similar. There's very, very few devices that are effectively plugged directly into to the home broadband these days. And most of the data that we need most of the transmission we need is, is inside buildings. And it's just so, so much better to provide that with a, a base station or an access point within that building because it, the signal level is much better because it doesn't have to penetrate the building from outside. But also the building itself acts as a way of preventing that signal from leaving the building and therefore from different cells interfering with each other, which means you can really push the capacity up. If we're going to provide something inside the building, it's got to have Wi-Fi within it because there are many devices that are Wi-Fi only, tablets, laptops, and so on. We could also provide cellular, but as I've said before, why? Um, you know, if it were free to do or very low cost, then fine, do it. Um, but if you're going to provide Wi-Fi and that's going to provide everything you need, that may be the answer. Now, clearly Wi-Fi can't do outdoors, so you definitely need cellular there. But if you've managed to move all the indoor traffic onto indoor networks, then that's going to reduce the loading on cellular, which makes the cellular stuff much easier. But of course, that does mean you need excellent fixed broadband to every building in order to link up the in-building systems. And we don't have that even in developed world. So that's where we probably need government intervention. And indeed, most governments do intervene to try and improve uh, the, the home broadband, you know, fiber to the home kind of access. So what does it all mean? Well, the future is still really uncertain. So I, I think we can be too clear about this. But I think first of all, we can say it's unlikely that 5G is gonna be the, the silver bullet that the industry wants, the, the way that it dramatically transforms its current financial challenges. Uh, and suddenly it goes screaming back up those stock market charts. It does help build capacity into the network, but not obviously revenue. Uh, which means that mobile operator revenues are continue to, to stagnate, not collapse, because we're going to carry on paying our monthly ARPUs. And we'll see some variation in some countries, but most, I think, will fall into the, the ever declining, ever more difficult situation. There is growth out there. I've talked about the growth in IoT, um, and that's good growth, but it's not dramatic revenue change. Nevertheless, it's valuable stuff, uh, and it will make a major impact to the sectors where it's deployed. And I talked about Wi-Fi and how that is becoming ever present and a more critical part of our system. So if we're not going to see any material monetary change, sooner or later things will start to crack. And I think we're already seeing regulators starting to indicate that they might be more amenable to, to mergers of mobile operators. So it feels like the whole competitive structure and value chain of the mobile industry it's likely to change over the next few years uh, and that will create all sorts of opportunities. So you know, in summary, 5G is fine. It's an evolution. It provides more capacity, but I can't see it being as influential to this world as the introduction of the automotive automobile 
or electricity. Uh, sadly, I think it's, it's not going to change the world dramatically. Uh, and it's not the um, utopian solution to everything that, that we're often told about. And that brings me to an end. Um, so time to hand back, I think, to Nigel and, and hopefully to some of the questions that uh, are out there. And I'll stop sharing my slides. Thank you very much, William. That's, uh, that's really good. Um, I, I didn't think you'd pack as much into that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, quite a tour and um, a difficult topic to take on, I think. Um, a lot has been said about 5G, but uh, a, very, a very good summary of, um, of where the technology has strengths and weaknesses, um, not least in politics. Absolutely. Um, I, I was uh, I was thinking um, uh, w when I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking, um, isn't uh, creating a new telecom system a bit like making um, a smoothie in a blender? <laughs> uh, and you, you you start off with a blender, and somebody needs to put a, a bit of liquid in just to get it going. And if you like, it's the seed capital that uh, yeah. nobody ever sees again. And, yeah. and then you, you you get a bunch of um, green grocers who've got the, uh, the fruits. So you've got somebody that uh, sells oranges and somebody that's very bright strawberries and somebody else with a, with a black currant and somebody else with a, with a kiwi fruit and that they're all desperate to get their fruit in there and that'd be the dominant flavor. And meanwhile, you've got someone, um, someone in marketing who's got their, their hand on the switch to turn it on and you haven't even put anything in it yet. <laughs> and, uh, so that yeah. so uh, fortunately there's a there's a sane engineer that's got his uh, hand on the the power switch and won't let uh, it doesn't matter how much you turn the blender on there's no power so <laughs> it just holds it back a little bit until there's something ready and then um then the the, the real the real difficult thing i suppose is uh, when you put the top on um you, you've got that little hole that you put the fruit through and that's a bit like the the regulators and if if you didn't have one then you'd have a right mess, it'd go everywhere. Uh, <laughs> if you put it in too early, then nothing gets passed. So um, you end up in the end with, um, with this fantastic smoothie and then you've got other people who are making the cups that people drink it from. And, and the cups are all sorts of different sizes. And it turns out that some of the smoothies don't fit in some of the cups, uh, the handset makers, of course, and, and the device makers. So uh, anyway, um, as you can tell, I, I had a, yeah. uh, an interesting afternoon. It's, it's, a lovely, it's a lovely analogy, a very visual one. I, I, I'm not so good at making up those kind of visual ones myself. I like that one. So uh, I think we've got um, uh, some questions come in. In fact, I can see the, the questions in, in the last uh, two or three minutes have um, come in thick and fast. So uh, fortunately, we have... Um, uh, three uh, question masters to uh, to help us today. We've got uh, Michael, Samantha, and Richard. Now let me see if I can just bring them on. Um, yeah, Samantha, are you starting the video? Okay, so. Uh, so Michael's going to start us off with the first question, I believe. Hi there. Um, so we've got quite a few questions that all relate to the role of 5G potentially to provide connectivity to rural areas where the cost of fixed ne networks is, is prohibitively expensive. Do you see that as a potential route for some revenue for these companies? So I think it would be a, a wonderful thing. You know, to, uh, Actually, my view is what, we, what the world really wants is excellent ubiquitous connectivity. So wherever you go, you have you know, 10 megabits or so that really allows you to, to connect well, and that includes rural areas. So, so, so I think that would be a wonderful thing. Sadly, 5G does not address that at all. So there's nothing in 5G that gives it a greater range than, than any existing system. And indeed, the frequency bands that it's going to be deployed in, by and large, mean that it's going to have a lower range than existing systems. So... So it doesn't really help in that respect. Uh, most of the rural problems are economic problems. 
and you try and pick the cheapest solution that delivers what you need. And frankly, that's going to be 4G rather than 5G. And if you look at, for example, the UK's proposal for a single shared rural network across mobile operators, that's planned to use 4G and not 5G. Um, so, so sadly, I think it was a missed opportunity. 5G could have had a mode that gave it much greater range, which allowed it to really excel in rural areas, but it's lacking that. And, I, and most operators I know of have got no intent of deploying 5G in rural areas anytime in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Okay, um, there's a question from Darren Fitzgerald, um, and there are similar ones linked to this. And I mean, you talked about COVID mm. and that reducing the need for 5G, but there are applications like remote surgery um, with the social distancing requirements that actually could be more favourable to be mm. where you remove the surgeon from the operating room. Um, and, and similarly, um, you know, applications such as autonomous vehicles, um, electric vehicles. So what do you think the, the demand for 5G from those applications might be? Um, so in general, not great, I think. So, so, so I think, I think the, the online premise is correct that the COVID and other things like that have created more of a need for for remoteness whether that be remote surgery or whether it be um you know the ability to, to know whether there's a queue at the pharmacy and it's not worth going yet because you don't want to get too close to people there or or transmitting data on temperature of people as they walk through places you know all of that stuff is even more necessary than before um, but actually a lot of that can and will be done over over 4g networks and you know, there have been a few cases of remote, not quite remote surgery, but where the surgeon is in the hospital, but stays in a safe area. And the nurses that need to go into the area where there's COVID infections, in any case, to, to obviously look after the patients, effectively take a camera with them and allow the surgeon to then observe what's going on and essentially almost be there. Um, but that all runs over the hospital Wi-Fi system. I mean, that's not a, a 5G kind of application. So um, not quite. Uh, and the autonomous cars, that's a real bugbear of mine. So um, you know, imagine that a car needed to have 5G connectivity to be autonomous. Um, so you, you take it out of the showroom, it drives itself to the nearest tunnel, and then it stops because there's no 5G connection in the tunnel. And it sits there for 10 years until somebody gets around to actually building a 5G connection. That ain't going to work. So clearly it has to work autonomously. It's why it's called an autonomous car without any connectivity at all. And it has to work pretty well without that connectivity. It's no good if it, you know, it bashes a few pedestrians and knocks off a few cyclists without connectivity, um, and then does, and then it's all fine when it's got connectivity. Clearly, that's not going to fly either, uh, or drive. Uh, so it has to be perfect without connectivity. And if it's perfect without connectivity, why does it need connectivity? Um, so I think that whole concept of you, know, you have to have 5G to, to make cars, connected cars work is, is, a, is flawed. And Tesla and others have come out and said quite explicitly, we do not need 5G, we do not plan for 5G. Where there's connectivity, we'll make use of it to upload map data and download maps and other things. But we absolutely do not need any kind of connectivity for even fully autonomous versions of our cars. Thank you. Excellent. I've got a, we've got a question here from uh, Pradeep. It's in connection with the uh, with the rollout of, um, of release 16. Mm -hmm. um, the 3G uh, PP uh, completed the release 16 uh, earlier this year in June. Yeah. Um, you s think it will be delayed till 2022. Can you uh, sort of explain the thinking behind that? Yeah, sure. So, so of course, there's, there's always some time from the finish of the specifications to the point in time that, that manufacturers can then produce the equipment. And then the time that the operators can then buy and deploy it and get it into their networks. And so essentially I'm guessing at that time lag, and I'm guessing that time lag is, is typically a minimum of two years. Now, you know, there'll be one or two pioneering companies who rush out a, a super early version and one or two pioneering operators who put one or two of these into trial networks and say, look, we've got a standalone system. So for sure there'll be um, versions that, that are claimed to be standalone much sooner but my expectation of the point where, you know, let's say the majority of 5G connections in a country like the UK are actually made over a standalone network is it'll be well beyond 2022. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if we we're at 2023 or 2024, given the complexity of replacing the whole of the core of a mobile network with something new and different. So, so that's kind of where I'm, 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 I'm guessing 
um, the time lag from standardization to deployment will occur. With that in mind, William, do you think that um, your, your point about um, removing Huawei and other Chinese technologies uh, is something that will help that along or, um, or make no difference? So I think it will possibly hinder it. Um, if, you've got, if you've got Huawei technology in your network, then it makes it hard, you, harder to introduce a new core because it's got to interwork with everything that's in the network, including the existing base stations. Mm -hmm. And if they're Huawei or, or some other vendor that's, that's also banned, then um, that vendor's unlikely to work closely with you to integrate into mm -hmm. a different core. So you're going to have to, in all likelihood, swap most of that kit out before you can realistically handle the core transition process. So it just will, will take, take the whole thing a lot longer um, to happen for those companies. We, we've got one here from Anonymous, but there's a, there's a few similar related ones as well. Um, the question is, do you think that 5G um, could have an application for defense in the deployed space? Uh, for intertactical command nodes. And my sort of opposite um, version of that question is, has the defense space um, helped drive or change any of the standards in a way that's positive or negative for the rest of us? Mm. So the short answer is I don't really know. Um, the problem with, with the defense side of things, well, the natural problem is, is of course, it's, it's, it's very secret, deliberately so. Um, and so it's very hard to know quite what they're doing unless you're in that space. And if you are, then you probably couldn't say anyway. I'm not. Um, so I'm not going to be able to give any, any secrets away because I know nothing about what's happening there. Um, yes, in principle, absolutely, they could use 5G. Um, and and may, it may well have value to them. You know, some of the applications like remote control of drones or whatever you can imagine potentially could be quite useful to, to military applications. Uh, so, so, so quite possibly, I think there's a number of issues around where they get the spectrum to do that. Although, frankly, if it's a battlefield, then I guess nobody's going to come along and tell them that they're, they're abusing somebody else's spectrum license um, and, and quite what the scale of, and, and timing of that might be. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's for sure it's a possibility. Okay, um, William, another question from anonymous um, attendee, mm -hmm. um, which is quite a good one, um, linked with um, networks um, is, a report that was published by the NIST Corporation um, in October 2019, which talks about cybersecurity risks of 5G. Um, and one of the main problems that they point out um, was the lack of experts in cybersecurity. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, um, so like defence, it's not, it's not my core area of expertise. I do know slightly more about security than I know about defence. Um, so, so I can say a few words, but, but not with huge authority. Um, so yeah, yes, as far as I know, there is a lack of people who really understand the space uh, and for sure that that's an issue. Um, you know, my, my, I think 5G or, or cellular networks have actually been pretty good at designing in pretty good space security. So there's very little, um, at least public information that 4G has been you know, hacked to any serious extent. Uh, and 5G is even better than 4G. They've fixed a few loopholes that they were aware of. So the, the base underlying system, I think, is pretty secure. The question is more whether you can get into the network management system or places like that and start to do things at that level that really maliciously change the network. And of course, that's, that's generally much easier. A disgruntled employee could either do it themselves or, or give someone else you know, the remote password to log into the network management system and, and, and make all sorts of horrible changes. And because 5G is so much more flexible and dispersed and can have all these clever things like slices and so on, it opens up a whole load of extra places where in principle a hacker could, could, could make hay. Now, um, whether they will and, and the extent to which those are really secured remains to be seen. Um, but I think with any new system, typically you, there, there are unexpected vulnerabilities and then over time you gradually close those down as you, as you spot them and, and, and react to them. And I suspect the same be true with 5G that that there will be more security hacks into it in the first few years than there are into 4G now because 4G is, has been sorted to a fair degree. Um, and so we'll see a, a rise in that. Um, you know, it's something we should all be wary and concerned about, 
but I don't see it as something that is sufficiently material that we should do less of 5G because of those issues. I think it'll be something that, that, that is hopefully, fingers crossed, kept to a manageable level. Okay. Thank you. We've got a question here from, uh, from Nicola. I, I think uh, yeah, hopefully we're mostly engineers uh, taking part in this webinar. So uh, there, there's, a, there's a load of uh, urban myths going around mm. uh, on this subject, but uh, what are the health concerns regarding 5G? I think there's one we can immediately dismiss. <laughs> yeah, so no different from 4G is the easy answer, or 3G or 2G or Wi-Fi or, or cordless telephones or any other device like that. Um, and you know, all the studies over many years have suggested that those health risks are immeasurably low. And indeed, the fact that we've been using cell phones for 30 years or more now, and you know, there's been no noticeable change in the population of the sort of things that that you might have seen if there were a risk such as brain tumors or whatever i think tells us everything we need to know that that there is no significant risk here now, 5g slightly different frequencies but not materially so in terms of the way it impacts the human body some people talk about you know when all these zillions of things start connecting that's going to change the the radio environment as i said for first of all i don't think that that many zillion things are going to connect but even if they do the amount that they transmit is so tiny that the amount of radio energy that's thrown into the environment is 0.01% you know, of what's already there or something like that. So uh, um, no, no material difference from current systems, which themselves have been shown to be safe, I think is the easy answer to that one. Thank you. Hi, um, so we have one here from Chris Burns, uh, who's asking about uh, regulation, the sharing of, of um, infrastructure between networks. So do you see that um, infrastructure sharing as a means of helping achieve coverage at acceptable cost for 5G? Um, so, so yes, I th and I think I, I was, I'd agree with everything apart, apart from I would drop the last few words for 5G. Um, infrastructure sharing it has been widely used. So here in the UK, for example, we basically only have two mobile networks. Uh, well, we've got four operators. Um, each pair of operators shares one underlying network and they share the masts and they share the, the power supplies and the transmission resources to that mast and pretty much everything apart from their own kit that goes on, on that mast. And, and that means that the cost that they see is, is dramatically reduced. Uh, I mentioned the, the idea of the single rural network, um, shared rural networks or ABSRN, that is that the government and the operators have agreed to deploy. And that's going to be one network shared amongst all four operators with about 500 masts in rural areas in the country. So that is moving us even further down that sharing route. But all of those were, were predicated on 3G or 4G. Now you can, of course, use them for 5G as well. It makes no, no material difference. Um, but actually, you know, the places where the, the, the operators are most inclined to share is the areas which are most economically difficult, which is the rural areas and to some degree the suburban areas. And actually some operators have been pulling out of network sharing agreements for city centers because they want to control their own sites there and because the economics are, are generally better for them. And, and city centers is where 5G is going initially. So, so it's not a 5G thing. 5G will leverage it to some degree, I'm sure. Um, but I don't think it's, it's something that's, that's novel to 5G in any way. Thanks. Okay, um, William, there's um, a couple of questions, a couple of people have asked the same question, um, one of which is Nigel Turner, um, and has asked if you can expand on your, on the slide which referred to network slicing, just explain, mm. explain how network slicing works. Mm, sure, so um, what, what essentially it does is it, it takes the overall network resource that's available, so a network will have a certain amount of radio channels if you like, um, and, it, and, it, and it will partition those out. So, so simplistically, you might say, well, um, I'm going to take half of the radio channels and give those to, to a very small group of users who are my high priority users. And I'm going to take the second half of the radio channel and give those to everybody else. And um, the high priority users may be only 1% of the user base, but they've got half the channels. So, so they've got a massive amount of resource, you know, 50 times more resource than, than everyone else. And therefore, they'll have a much better quality of service because the chances that they'll get congestion um, is much, much lower. And then, of course, you can then say, well, why only two different divisions? I can make 10 different divisions 
um, with much more sort of granular slices. So that's, in essence, that's the, the concept. Of course, it's more complicated than that because there's more places than just the radio channel where congestion might occur, it might occur in the, the backhaul or the core networks or, or elsewhere. Uh, and you need to kind of what's called orchestrate this whole concept uh, and how that's done is actually turns out to be really quite complicated. And, and in a way, maybe one of the, the real issues with slicing. But the underlying problem is, um, you know, it, it's a bit like um, the check-in desks at an airport where um, you may have um, three check-in desks for first class and three check-in desks for everyone else, despite the fact there's only one tenth of the number of first class passengers. And therefore they have far less queues at their check-in desks than, than the other check-in desks um, because you've effectively sliced that total check-in desk resource into two, two blocks uh, and then segregated the users so that some get a better experience than others. Thank you. I'm going to take two questions and sort of roll them into a combined one um, here, William. We've got one from uh, one from Brian, one from Richard, um, and it's what's the difference to, to me? And I'm going to assume this is a sort of a domestic environment between broadband and 5G, uh, and then a comment that, uh, of course, this this day and age, telecoms is effectively mission critical to to those of us, many of us, who are working from home. Um, so, do we not need an alternative for when uh, the broadband goes down? Uh, close to my heart, we had a power failure um, just uh, just Monday as well. Yeah, okay, so so first of all, I mean, terminology is really messy, so uh, I understand the confusion. And, you know, there's mobile broadband, there's fixed broadband, there's there's home broadband to a fixed node provided by a mobile network, um, and, and probably all sorts of other messy connotations. So so the term broadband is, is really vague, and you know, I guess most people would possibly think of the home network, but but others might think of the mobile. So, so it is all mixed up. Uh, and then 5G, of course, claims to be high data rates, which is broadband. And so you know, the, the whole thing is is difficult to to simplify down to a one thing or another. Um, in so much as there is a vision, it's kind of fixed versus mobile. And um, for most of us, our home network is fixed. It's provided by a, a copper line or a, a cable or a fiber optic cable uh, into the home. And then there's also mobile, which might make it into the, to the house if we're lucky through the windows, uh, providing an alternative. And, you know, yes, it's great to have redundancy. So, you know, absolutely uh, we're all reliant on this stuff. And um, if it goes down, then you know, we're stuffed and it's great to have a backup. And most people have somebody have got that. So, you know, uh, I rely pretty much on my Wi-Fi, but if that does go down, I can fire up my 4G phone. I can run it as a Wi-Fi hotspot. I can link the laptop into it. It might take me a few minutes to reconfigure everything, but uh, but I can get it all running eventually on that. Now, you know, as that I'm lucky, I've got 4G coverage leaking into the house from outside. It gives me that backup. Um, would it be worth building a, a nationwide 5G network with excellent in-building coverage and data rates just to provide backup to the fixed network? Probably not. I mean, it's nice to have, but it's it's effectively building an entire second network just for those relatively rare occasions when the when the fixed network does go down. Um, yeah, I suspect we wouldn't pay twice as much as we currently pay for our our broadband just to have that that backup capability. Not most of us, anyway. There might be a few who would, but but not the majority. Thank you. We've got a, a very short one here from Perry. Uh, which is, is 5G going to compete with Wi-Fi 6? <laughs> um, so, the, so the standard answer that most people in the industry will give you is, oh no, they're complementary. Um, yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, you know, there's always a choice of how you connect. Well, not always. If you're in a building or, or near a building, then you've got a choice. You can connect over Wi-Fi, you can connect over cellular. Now, for the most part, your phone makes that choice for you. And if it knows the, the name of the Wi-Fi hotspot, it will automatically connect over Wi-Fi and therefore not connect over cellular. Um, and if the Wi-Fi is even better because it's Wi-Fi 6, which is 6 gigahertz with more bandwidth, then it, you know, that's, it's, it's even more likely that it will do that and less likely to use cellular. So there's, there, there is inherently a trade-off. The only thing to say is that by and large, the mobile operators don't care because typically we pay a fixed monthly fee for our mobile usage. Um, and if we transfer to Wi-Fi, we still pay the same fixed monthly fee. So they still get their money regardless of what happens. Uh, and actually it's better for them because there's less traffic on their network. So as long as we don't get to the stage where we start saying, actually, I don't even need cellular at all, which is unlikely, 
then that competition doesn't equate to, to, to any revenue issues. Um, so it doesn't become a big deal. Um, but yeah, they're alternatives in many situations and, and, and therefore effectively competitors. Great, thank you. Okay, William. Um, there's a question here from Nigel Rowe, which is quite a good one. Um, so you talked about the impact of COVID. He said, do you think that COVID will actually open up the market for more virtual reality applications, such as we're all watching football from our home? Um, surely the experience could be improved and wouldn't 5G play a part in it? Yeah, um, virtual reality is some of those really interesting you know, things that's, that's always on the cusp apparently of, of arriving and being great. Um, I, I'm not certain. I think history has told us that anything that involves wearing glasses is doomed to failure, wearing, you know, clunky glasses. Um, and you can think back at all the various, you know, Google Glass and all the other kind of various things. And even watching 3D TV with those silly polarised glasses, everyone just hates it. Um, so uh, added to that fact that I think about half the population feels sick when they try virtual reality um, makes me feel that it's probably not got a, a, a dramatic future ahead of it. Uh, but even if it were, then you know, I think he, his question is, is on the spot that we would use it at home. I think exactly right. You're not going to use it walking down the street because you'll just walk into things and kill yourself. Um, and if you're using it at home, then you've got a wonderful way of connecting it. It's called Wi-Fi. Um, it's got more bandwidth than 5G. It's faster. It's got better signal strength and it's got lower latency. Why go to all the trouble of trying to use 5G when you can just use Wi-Fi? Um, so... Now, that, that I think is the ultimate flaw in that argument that actually um, getting 5G into the home at a signal level that makes it work really well probably means it has to be deployed in the home. And that's a really intractable problem um, right now because it's so hard for me to deploy my own 5G system in the home, um, but it's not for Wi-Fi. And indeed all the virtual reality kit out there at the moment uses Wi-Fi and not cellular. Can I just ask actually a related question to that though, William? Um, another one raised um, was that apparently um, there's been rumours that BT are going to stop um, land, landline broadband from 2025. If that was to be the case, is there more of a place for 5G in the home? So it's not landline broadband they're stopping. Um, they're stopping effectively old fashioned what's called plain old telephony services over, over the, the network. So essentially standard dial up type stuff that you know, if you've got a decked phone or even, even perish the thought of a phone that's plugged into the wall um, in your home, then come 2025, that will stop working. All you'll have is a, a broadband pipe to your broadband router. And if you want to do voice, you'd have to use WhatsApp or, or something else like that over that. But the broadband pipe itself will absolutely be there uh, and indeed, BT are planning to, to make that ever better with fibre rollout and that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. So, so from that uh, virtual reality, we've, we've reached the reality of the, uh, the last question. And I think that's coming from uh, Richard. Yes, we've got a good one. I think you, you very, very briefly touched on it right at the beginning of your, uh, your, your talk, William. A uh, good question here do you, from Steve. Do you use any 5G devices other than for pro professional interest? If so, what and why? I think you mentioned a bicycle that sounds like it's <laughs> instrumented to death. Um, so the short answer is no, I don't even have a 5G phone. Um, and um, part, of, part of the reason is because um, I don't live anywhere near a city and I don't go to cities very often and therefore I see absolutely no point uh, in that. Uh, and partly because even if I did, I'm not sure what the benefit would to, to me would be. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a gamer. I'm not a virtual reality user. Um, so I'm not the kind of really demanding user for that. So you know, maybe that, that partly explains it. Um, I do have lots of connected devices, lots of IoT devices. Um, they are all connected using things like Bluetooth or similar kinds of very short range, low power type technologies. Um, so all the devices on my bike use a, a, a Bluetooth low energy solution um, to connect to the, the head end that sits on the bike, which then uses Bluetooth to my cell phone. Um, so not really 5G. I mean, you could argue if, if, if everything to do with IoT is going to be rebranded re as 5G, then yes, but, but not in any kind of conventional sense. Thank you. Well, what a good one to, uh, to end on. Um, yeah, uh, a, a large number of questions came through today and uh, we're, we're very delighted to um, uh, have uh, put you on the spot, William, with uh, all sorts of different questions beyond even the topic that you were talking about. Um, 
a little known fact about William is uh, he's a, a cycling nut. And um, I, I think if, if there was the equivalent of the Iron Man for cycling, then, then William would be the person uh, in, in the many uh, extreme cycling challenges that, uh, that he takes on board. So I, I think I put that down to, to sampling the, um, the, the radio frequencies in the hills and mountains wherever he goes. It's a nice thought. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for those questions. It's, it's fabulous to, to have that. It's so much nicer to have interaction, albeit limited, than, than just to, to talk into the ether and hope that somebody's listening. So we really then, it just um, remains to thank everybody that has taken part today. So we've got... Um, Big thanks to William, of course, for his excellent presentation and uh, our question masters, Samantha, Michael and Richard, who've uh, given him the grilling. Thanks to Tim for organising, producers today, Colin and Julie. And uh, that really is the end of today's presentation. So thanks very much for taking part and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>